Um, yes, I have a question. You, you've, to, you've talked about the problems of the Six Nations in, in the context only of the Six Nations. So how does your situation compare to other claims in other parts of Canada? And is there any coordination or uh, on issues of strategy that, that it is possible to get out of this trap by looking actually what's happening to other nations in Canada? Okay. Um, okay, we're the largest First Nations in Canada. You know, we, we're, we, we've got about 18,000 on reserve, give or take, but we're hitting around 30,000 people. Many other communities, you're talking, you're lucky two to 3,000 people. Uh, many are poor. We're in a great location for work, for education, for everything. We're not in the north, we're not isolated. Uh, Canada's a bully. Canada's claims policy is, is really, uh, it's an abuse of their power, it's abuse of them as a fiduciary, what they're doing. Other First Nations, they would take the $13 an acre they wouldn't put up the fight because they haven't got it. They haven't got it. They can't. They can't endure the fight. You know, they need housing. They need water. They need that, and they get bullied all the time. And I, I got to be very blunt. There's a lot of non-native lawyers out there who, in good faith, start the process, and because they don't have resources to start a court case or, or challenge him, they run up a tab. And when Canada does make an offer that's insulting. The lawyer wants to get paid too. I shouldn't say it's all of them, but some actually side with the Crown to force the First Nations to settle. It's all under duress. When we've advised them, the claims policy is set for, you can settle a claim as long as it's under $150 million and you extinguish whatever interest they decide. Some of them bundle claims. If you got, if you got a a valid land right issue on that, and you've got three others, without looking at the three others, we'll only settle with you on this one if you throw those other three in. And when people are poor, when there are suicides in their community, they take it. It's sad, they take it. You know, and that's, that's the other thing. A great friend of mine who just passed away, I, it, it's like we're on 5% of our original holdings. The native people in this country are on 0.2% of the land base of Canada. That's why there's hopelessness. What can you do with that? You can't build an economic base. That's why there's suicides. People give up. The youth have no future. So, you know, it, it's... It's, it's very disheartening what has been allowed to go on. It's apartheid. It, it's, name it. You know, it, it's, it's horrible that Canada, the country they are, that that was allowed to go on. We hope there's a new chapter and we can move forward. That's, I'm hopeful of that. And I'm hopeful that Canadians are going to expect nothing less of their government from that to happen. So I'm, I'm hopeful. It's got to be better. It can't be even worse. Let's put it that way. Good evening. I want to thank you for coming here uh, and uh, walking us through this in a great deal of detail. It would have been great to actually see more of it. Yeah. Um, I just want to, one thing I did uh, that did strike me was um, how much of what you are using as, as legal recourse is founded in, in contract, in contractual negotiations as opposed to a kind of uh, claim to traditional territory. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you talk about that a bit in, in terms of the in terms of the difference? How how easy is it for you? How hard is it for you? And how and uh, and 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 how does that distinction uh, make you uh, operate differently? Okay. Well, let me give you a real history on this one. We've tried to do it through the UN before. Before it was the League of Nations. We had a chief in 1920s, 22. Discahe, he went to the League of Nations. He was allowed to speak about the land rights over there. 
but Canada refused to attend. And under the, the rules of the League of Nations back then, you couldn't make a decision unless the challenged country is present, you know. But he was never allowed back into Canada. He ended up dying over in the Tuscarora Reserve in Niagara Falls. And then his remains were eventually brought back, and he's at, a, he's at his home on the, at the Cougar Long House, Lower Cougar Long House. Things have changed. We know the courts. We know the legal system. We have lawyers. And I, I think it's, it, it's I, I talked earlier about our traditional lands, that the beaver hunting grounds, and, and I failed. I, 1764, we were fighting among our, our, our brothers and sisters out there, the Hurons and Wyandots and all of them. We said enough, we had a big treaty drawn at Niagara, 1764. It's called the dish with one spoon where we all agreed no more fighting, that part of Ontario, it would be treated as the dish and we were all going to eat from it from one spoon. On that principle alone, we were to share. It was not meats and bones, you own this, no, don't step over that fence. And it was also meant to prevent greed. So now this is, I was talking before, some of the younger generations have a lot of learning curve to know this. In fact, in March 1st and 2nd, we're holding this a conference of, uh, with Six Nations, is hosting one with the other First Nations of Southern Ontario, and we're bringing some of our elders to, to go over these treaties. So as far as claiming ownership per se, that was not part of our mentality on a meets and bone ownership. Now the Haldeman track, we're not challenging Canada on a treaty right. We're challenging them under trust law. There's no, they can't use a statute of limitations on us. They can't use all the legal defenses that they're able to use in other open cases because the fiduciary is still there. They are still acting. They are still controlling my life, my children's life from birth to death. They can decide whether I can leave my land to my children. Regardless of what I say, they can decide that. So the if they're going to act in that role as a trustee, you stand up and tell us what you did with every little acre and every little penny that was derived from that Haldeman track. So that's what's different about how we're approaching this. But the biggest thing is to be able to avoid legal defenses that Canada will throw at us. And, on and we named Ontario because they'll do this. So that's what's different about it. And the Haldeman track is, is laid out much differently than other treaty areas and the planes and the number treaties and so on because we were promised that this track was going to be under the same title ownership as we held before the British came because we challenged what right they had to cut deals on our lands at the Paris signing of the Paris Agreement. I don't know if I just full of wind or went where we're <laughs> okay. Um, there's a really fine grain to all of the kind of property issues that you have up to Brantford. Yeah. Is there a kind is there a similar grain through all of the other blocks or are the blocks there treated as as, as kind of big unified things? Some were uh, block block two was uh, divided. See what one of the blocks is and actually they finally stopped it is maybe it's block three, was actually the guy got the land and he started subdividing and selling it and he never paid a penny. And that's what we're challenging. How can he be collecting money when we're not getting paid? And he failed to pay and the mortgage goes in default, but he made a bunch of victims along the way too. And the Crown allowed this to happen because they didn't have, they didn't have the wisdom to set up a land tenure system here. And they couldn't, didn't have a system to deal with Six Nations people who didn't have a concept of being able to sell their, their, their children's lands. So we were caught in two different systems. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you for the talk. And as okay. Val was saying, thank you for walking us through this. And actually my question is a bit of a, I mean, picks up a little bit from what Val was asking in terms of the, I mean, the fact that you're fighting this through the legal system. But it's also, I find that, um, 
even in the way that you start to describe the relation to the land or uh, you know this notion that there would be a return on investment uh, and I you know there's there's something even in terms of like how things could be settled that it seems like it would always ultimately be settled on someone else's uh, terms uh, because of the language and the apparatus to which the set settlement is sought yeah. and I'm just wondering um, how important you feel that these underlying implications, you know, they, these underlying assumptions in terms of how this is challenged, I mean, how this is fought in a way, how important would it be that these would be actually addressed and challenged? Well, you know, as I, as I mentioned, okay, there's $4 billion collected in the Haldeman track. Land transfers, you know, take, take a percentage off the land transfer agreement, set it aside. It's just, Ontario doesn't need that because if Ontario says, I'm going to turn this around on you, I'm not going to get into trying to defend that part. We've done checking out with Indian Affairs and the Health Canada and all the different departments that run us. Of all the money you hear that they get set aside for Indians, you know, billions, I don't even know what the figure is. At the reserve level, we get from 14 to 20 cents on the dollar. The government, departments, all the naysayers, all the lawyers are reaping a lot of money before it gets to us. If we went direct payment, and we, our community is very accountable, we account to our people. We have every year we have a full audited statement comes to our people because you hear about, oh, this, this band's crooked or that band's crooked. There may be a couple, but it's Hell, it's no different than the senators that we just heard about in the last years. <laughs> and there's a few, but not all senators are crooks, I hope. But if we streamlined them and took them out of, the, out of the scenario, and keep in mind, it's not for everybody. We could handle our own affairs. We have our own police force. It's, it's, it's in the dynamics of the size. We have the capability to do it. We have lawyers. You know, we need our own justice system. Because the justice system out there as it is today, nobody takes care of the victim. And that's part of our culture. If you do something wrong, you've got to make it right to them. So it doesn't fit, you know, just somebody goes off to jail, you know. What happens to the victim? There's so many things that would be easy, easy to address. Our education system. The high school system, I was just talking to the people out there, the elementary schools. You know, we don't have, a, we're the largest First Nation in Canada, we don't have a high school in our community. Then we do the research, why? Because the surrounding municipalities want that money, the Indian money, to pay for their schools so they can keep the cost of their schools down. And what I found out more insulting is the Grand Erie School Board has deemed our children to be special needs children. So there's about 800 kids and, we, and they pay more money for special needs children. My kids aren't stupid. You know, our kids, a lot of our kids are, are the top students in the high schools. But as part of that funding, you're supposed, there's 800 kids. Part of that funding is you're supposed to get money to take care of those kids. They, take, they took care of four last year out of that 800, but they got the big bucks to run it so they can finance their schools. So it's all a matter of efficiency, I'm saying. We can alter that. We can have our own school, teach our languages, teach the math, the sciences. Our people are very good with their hands. You know, they like to build things. But when they can't get an apprenticeship because their math's not of a grade 12 standard, just like, just like the non-native they went to school with, it's the same problem. We want to run our own education system, but we want a stable amount of money to do it because of the size of our community. I've known of smaller communities that by Christmas they're selling pencils to buy furnace fuel to keep the school warm. We can't afford to make that mistake. Because we got to take, we, we, it's our responsibility to take care of our kids. The transfer of funds that the governments are collecting from the people within the Haldeman track, we would need about that much to run our community. 
the taxes being collected within our community that are going to the federal government. I'll give you an example of the cigarette company, $220 million. If that, if that stayed in our community, we wouldn't need anything from anybody. We could handle our education, our health, everything. But there's solutions here, but people got to look at it. And that's all we're asking for. How do we protect and maximize our investment that was made with or without approval? It was without approval in this country, but no return. That's what we're after. That's what we want is the accounting. Canada, and what are you going to do to fix this? That's all we're asking. Okay. What happens with the case in the end? Do they just close it? Is it left open indefinitely? Like, what happens? Block five, $113 an acre. So they just give you an unsatisfactory... Yep. It's arbitrary. That's what they do with 90% of the First Nations of Canada who are in, the, are in their game. And if you don't accept it, they'll cut off your funding. And some people have borrowed so much money. Oh, the BC Treaty Commission. There are hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. And if they... There's going to be a time. If they fail to come to a region of consensus, Canada's going to call on that loan and they'll put that First Nation in third party management and they'll take over all their affairs. It's awful what they're doing out there. They can't keep getting away with this. That's why we appear before the United Nations and tell the, the world what the hell's going on. Canada, Canada is good, but they can be doing a lot better for the native people than this. You know, thank goodness for opportunities like this. You know, I've spoken to this university, other universities, uh, church groups, the UN. Uh, they've, they've got, this story has to be told. Thank goodness for the truth and reconciliation. You know, that, that brought out a lot. That brought out a blemish. But that was a fact. That was a fact that happened. And that is still affecting our communities today. What was the outcome of talking to the UN? Like when you brought this story to the UN, what was the outcome of that? Um, well, they made a recommendation. The North, the North American, they, the, what do you call it? the UN, UN Permanent Forum made a recommendation for Canada to go to Six Nations. We now are talking with Canada and Ontario, trying to set up a framework on how we're going to talk and move these things forward. There's been a lot of churches, a lot of Universities, a lot of groups have written letters to the Prime Minister, the Minister of Indian Affairs on our behalf, encouraging this. Get to the negotiating table. Uh, as of June, we started. We're developing a framework agreement. Canada is having a problem getting, giving up control of us. So we're bringing in a mediator. And in two weeks, I think it's two weeks we go and we're going to meet with a mediator in Canada and Ontario. Because we're going to have to bring in some heavyweights over Canada who have access to Parliament, to Cabinet, who can really make decisions. The bureaucrats, you know, well, when, I give you what you want, what am I going to do? You know, that's kind of their attitude. It's moving. It's slow, but it's moving, but it's not going to happen fast. We're in a hurry. We're not going to go anywhere. You know, we're going to be here. My kids are going to be here. They're going to be smarter than I ever was. They may not be as tolerant. That's my fear. And the way things are going in this world today, I don't know. We've got to stop this and get it resolved before things get out of hand. Because we've got the pipelines. My experience, once you open these things up and it gets into confrontation, you can't put it back in that, that toothpaste back. You know? It takes on a life of its own. So, I need people like you to, we've lobbied the MPs up in this area, but they're all pretty well conservatives, not our best friends. So, uh, that's probably why we're not getting support down in, uh, well, it's not really that much. There's only a lib one liberal in our area, but they've been helpful. But the liberals were also in power. They could have resolved this back then. They're not immune, but the laws have changed, UN declarations changed. People have changed, and I hope it's for the better. Yes.
I was curious to know if you've seen any difference between the current administration and the last administration with your dealings with the court cases. Wow, well, a lot of promises, eh? <laughs> Actually, uh, yes, they've been open, very open to talk. We went, we went and taught, lobbied uh, the federal government. We taught, lobbied the NDP. We lobbied the liberals. We lobbied as best we could the conservatives. We lobbied the Green Party before the election. All of them. We didn't pay, you know. All of them. The negotiator sat down with us. At the time, it was uh, under the PC government. They told us, your claims are too big. I'm, I'm, I'm being recorded. I'm not supposed to be telling this because it was in confidence, but your claims are too big. <laughs> your claims are too big. The present government does not have an appetite for you guys. Stay in court and wait till after the next election. That was all they could give us. The liberals agreed. They, they like a global solution, a relationship based on our treaties. That's what it is. Peace, friendship, and respect, and sharing. That's how it is. And we just go back to it. it. It's quite simple. But their problem is, what do we do with the other First Nations? Well, the other First Nations don't want what we want. You know? We don't need fishing rights on, on the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. We, we're, we're a different culture. And that's the problem. They think we all want the same thing. You all got to settle for the same thing. And that's not so. The Liberal government, in all fairness, especially on Native issues, they got 10 years of backlog to catch up. Native people and the environment were crapped on in the previous government. We all know that. And such a big debt, the words are nice. And this is a long-term payment plan, how to work this out and move forward. We're offering the best way out we're offering any way out. We don't want to go to, we don't want to waste another how many millions in court action if we don't have to. So, our, you know, we could use that money elsewhere in our community. Maybe we could pay for the other 400 students to get a university degree. Our community is making a lot of sacrifices for justice. No doubt about it. Uh, NDP, they've been supportive. The liberals, yes. But like I said, they got a lot of catching up to do. I have faith. It will come. It will come. Thank you. I think we're at um, 8 o'clock. Okay. Um, so thanks very much, Phil, for sharing your life's work with us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.